Come in, continue to come in uh, this evening. Uh, before we get started, I'm, I'm going to start off with the testimony, and it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, last night, I bugged out of here uh, before the service was over. Uh, a student on the football team asked me to be at the end of the game because they he said they were going to circle up and pray again. They have been able to the last couple of years in their administration statements, whatever. <coughs> But uh, they, he asked me to be there. He wants me to be So I show up. They go through shaking hands. And, and I get to Andy Hall. My name's Alex. Get out here. Yeah, I'm coming. Uh, and I'm walking out there. Before I get out there, <laughs> it circled up. The kicker of it is, it was a night, a husky, a night, a husky, a night, a husky, all the way around the circle. Both teams circled up. I'm telling you, young death is an amazing statement. They suffered a young man's death on their football team. And it, it rocked their world. And isn't it interesting? They're reaching out to the one answer that's going to give them comfort and strength. And, and Pilger High School suffered the death of a young girl, eighth grader. Uh, just recent funerals today, actually. Mm -hmm. It rocks people's world. But it draws them to the one that can give them hope, that can give them comfort. So I just praise the Lord God for last night, what took place last night. Two of the players, one from Pilger, one from uh, West Central, uh, prayed. Um, and it was good. It was good. It wasn't me and them, it was us. God is good. Thank you for coming out tonight. We're going to uh, go before our Heavenly Father and worship and praise. If you would stand with us. If you're able, zip if you need. We're flexible, right? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we praise you and glory and we come to you. And we just lay before you our hearts and our lives. We thank you for all, all the things that you've allowed into us. Things that uh, create that perseverance and that character to be the mature believer in you, Jesus. Those victories that you give us, that give us encouragement. Encouragement to go one more day, to, to press on, because we know you've won the victory. But we come before you now. Just give you thanks for your love, and your mercy, your grace, your discipline, your uh, judgment, your sovereignty. I just, I just covered all this. I thank you on that screen. We pray this as we come now. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. One of the songs that Richard Schlup used to do a lot, and we used to start off a lot of the Sunday night services with, the windows of heaven are open. I don't know if I'm on. One second. You're on. I'm on. Okay. Good. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling, the night is say There's joy, joy, joy in my heart, since Jesus made everything right. Yes, he did. I gave him my old heavenly garments, he gave me a robe of pure white of a tray. I'm feasting on heaven from heaven. That's why I'm happy tonight. Oh, the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a
It's what? It is not Halloween. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, you're right. I All thought right. you were talking about your microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Get that going here. Thank you for being patient. You know, when this song was getting sung decades ago, We Shall See the King, they felt that they were probably close to his return. And in the big scope of things, they were. But just think how many people that we've had here come through our doors, come through all the Billy Graham crusades, all the uh, great moves of God uh, throughout the whole world. Internet, all the, the things, TV, radio, it, it changed so much. And God knows what he's doing as far as timing that return. But as we go through what I feel now is a much closer spot, it won't be long till we see the King.
Hallelujah. We thank you, God, for that blood. We thank you, Lord, for making that way for us, God. We pray that we'll continue, God, to be a light in our community. We thank you for things in the past, but we look to you for our future, God. The future that you prepared for us. And we just pray that you'll give us boldness in your Holy Spirit, Lord, to do what you've asked us to do. And we thank you, Lord, for every blessing that you give us each day. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated at this time. Uh, we've got uh, two speakers tonight, Pastor Matrick and Pastor Dennis, who will be sharing this evening. But before, as he comes forward, is there any, anybody else want to give a testimony? I gave mine earlier. Thanks for listening. Anybody got one testimony? No, we'll come back to it. Oh, Gordon. Ken, the auctioneer. There it is. Well, I just thank the Lord for being able to be here for the 100th anniversary. Jim Anderson and I were the only two in here that the old church was over there. And his granddad lived to be, he was the first chairman of the board, Jim's granddad, he lived to be up in his 90s. But I never figured I'd ever live that long. I, uh, my granddad died at 55, my uncle Chester Martin at 57, my own dad at 60. So we never had much longevity in our life. But I just thank the Lord for all through the years that, that uh, the Lord has. I didn't figure out saying anything until tomorrow morning, but I just felt glad to say a little bit tonight. <coughs> tomorrow morning I plan to say a little more for the first time. I just wanted to speak one time, but I know the Lord spoke to me tonight and wanted me to say a little bit more. So. <coughs> Greetings to the Church of God at Casino. Does that sound like New Testament? <laughs> Forty-five years ago, I was I had graduated from North Central and I was working in a grocery store uh, while I went through North Central. I did, I did four years and three and uh, worked more, quite a bit of time uh, in the grocery store. And after that, I got out of school. I took a job, or took a job as manager, or assistant manager in the store uh, because nothing had opened up for a church. I did that for a year, and they decided that they were going to uh, be open on Sundays, and they were going to start selling Playboy magazine. And I sent Mary Lou, my wife. By the way, my wife Mary Lou and my daughters Jennifer and Rachel. Rachel surprised us and, and came today, too. So two of my three daughters are here. Say hi to But they they decided they were they had to uh, sell Playboy magazines, and I had sent Mary Lou around. She went to other stores like Target and all these, and they didn't sell them at that point. And I presented that to the leadership, and they, that didn't make any difference. So the boss took me out to lunch one day, and he said, after lunch, he said, either you sell the magazines or you're done. And I said, I guess I'm done. And that night, we got a call about casino. And Mary Lou and I said yes to God. That's a, a beautiful theme of your, your celebration here and I think it's fantastic because that's what it's about and it's about giving glory to God it's, it, 
it's God who has done it, right? And people have been used as vessels. It's been 40 years since we left. A lot has happened. A lot has happened here. Life has gone on. There's been a lot of people that have died, including young people. Our young people that were met with us in the, the, the parsonage over here and the teenagers that were in the, the orchestra and whatever, they're all married or, or, and many have quite a few children and a lot of them have grandchildren. Well, that's the same way with us. And, they, and, and many of you have gone through a lot of trials. A lot of trials during that time, and some of them are really hard. So did our family. We went through a really tough time. And I'll never know why God did put us through that trial. But I do know the operative word is through. We got through the trial. And that's what God is about. God is good. I, I uh, personally, in health, had three heart attacks, bypass surgery. I survived a massive heart attack with a miraculous uh, technology, new technology at the time. I didn't have any side effects, even though I, they told me I didn't even know I had a right side. It was totally uh, not there. And, and then I got diagnosed with cancer. And uh, the amazing thing, I had 70% cancer cells in my, my bones. I've got multiple myeloma, it's the disease. A month after I started treatment, they took a bone biopsy for a study that I was going to be in. And guess what? They didn't find any cancer cells. That's, I think that's kind of a God thing. <laughs> The, the, the thing that happened is that the chemo is what has me not really being able to walk very good. It's, my legs have gone bad, but God was through there, through it all. That's what I'm, that's what I'm telling you. God, God heals. And, you know, life goes on, and that's what God is about. A lot of memories back here at the casino. A lot of good memories. And this was the only church that, that we pastored. And so this flock has always been my flock. It's always, we've always tried to keep up somewhat over the years. We came back many years and then, then their kind of tenant was that lapse. And, and then we were able to make contact with some of your your ministers that have gone out in their ministries and to be a part of their ministry, and what a blessing. And that's part of the heritage of this, this church. When Bruce asked me to, to speak, somehow the Holy Spirit or God impressed on me to remember the call. Remember the call. And that's, that's something that uh, I want to leave with you or remind you of a few truths that we have. They're, they're, I call them fiery truths, and I'm not a fiery pre preacher. I was, I was never known as a long-winded preacher. I was, I was probably more known as one of the best fire keepers in the furnace that we had to be. And I, and I told people I enjoyed it. Uh, cutting the wood and splitting it. It was one of those things you saw results immediately. You know what that's like. And in ministry, sometimes you don't see results. But first of all, the re remember the call to ministry. And I say, remember the call, and I can say, remember your call. Maybe you were called to ministry. We're going to go to the Word. 1 Samuel chapter 3. And we're going to read about a little boy. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. 
Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was all, almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, but Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied. Well, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again Samuel got up and went to tell Eli, Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you. Go back to bed, Eli said. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, Go and lie down again, and if someone calls again, say, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed, and the Lord came and called us before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, Speak, your servant is listening. You know, are we listening? Are we listening? The little Samuel was called. He heard the voice of God and he went into the ministry. Paul. We know the conversion of Paul back in Acts chapter 9. And these are the, the two scriptures I'm going to read tonight. Verses 1 to 6. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went into the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for the cooperation and the rest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. He was called. He was called. I see people out here in the audience today, or the congregation, you've been called into the ministry. How many people in the past have been called from this, this congregation since 1922? There, there's a list around someplace, I guess, but I know it's not complete. And if you think of generations, as, as was <coughs> talked about on Wednesday night or Thursday night, the buckets, passing it on, how, how it multiplied. How many people, how many generations that kids that have left here and all their kids are in the, in the ministry or at, at least all serving the Lord. What a, what a heritage. And that is for the future also. Are you going to say yes to God? Are you going to say yes to the call of God? And again, glory be to God. Glory to God for it all. Remember the call to the Word, number two. The Word says, The Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How powerful is that Word? It's a, it's a two-edged sword. It was an old minister, and I'm sure you've heard this, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. This old minister got up and they asked him what was the greatest truth he ever learned. You know what he said? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Isn't that great? That is the truth. The Word of God. Stephanie last night mentioned the Bible portions that we used to sing. We used to sing, sing the Bible as what we did. And I, if I remember correctly, 
uh, back then, that was in the 70s, the late 70s, the Jesus people. And the Jesus people sang from the Bible. What a great way to remember the Word of God. While I was here, I, I, I started reading the Word. You know, we all read the, hopefully we all read the Word. I decided I was going to read the Word from cover to cover. <clears throat> and I even, uh, in my first, one of my first times through, taped it. I made tapes, I put labels on them, put them in albums. They would never be worth anything. Nobody's going to listen to, to me reading the Bible, but it was a practice and a discipline that I did for myself, and I read through the entire Old Testament and New Testament. That was quite a few uh, cassette tapes back then. <laughs> <laughs> they all went by the wayside. They're not around, but God's Word is there. God's Word <laughs> and told me not to turn. How precious it is. The Word of God that's been preached from the, the pulpit here, whether it's Jim Menzies' pulpit or whatever ways back since the tent, how many souls have been saved? How many lives have been changed? How many lost have found people being loved because the Word was preached? And it's the absolute truth. This is the absolute truth. We have it in our hands. What our world needs is an absolute truth. But they need it in, in a form of love also. And we have that because we have Jesus, right? Jesus, we're told in the Word, is the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus. So the, the, the living word, that's, that's, that's something that's kind of hard to comprehend, isn't it? I mean, we think we've got a grasp on it, but that's one of the reasons that if you read the word, all of it, it can come alive like it's never come alive before. And something you've read many, many times can mean something totally different because it's the living word. It's the Word of God. To God be the glory. <clears throat> Thirdly, remember the call to prayer. Our country used to be a Christian country. We're nowhere near it now, as we know. It's, it's, we're, in a, we're in a sad time. Morality is... is really gone, and part of that is because we don't have any absolute truth anymore. There's uh, whatever you do, as somebody talked about here, I believe, the judges, and doing what was right in your own eyes, that's what it's about. So anything, if you think it's okay, it's okay. Well, we know that to not be true, right? How we need prayer. I think of, I think of Esther. We recently read Esther in our devotions at home. And Esther was a young person. Young people think about it. She was a young girl, and there was something said in Esther. She was told, I believe, by Mordecai, her uncle, that she must be there for such a time as this. If she hadn't been there, all her people, the Jews, would have been destroyed. But she had, what she said after that, she was told that she said, I'll pray about it. And she, she went into prayer and fasting and she told Mordecai to have all the people prayer and fast. What a time we are in in our country for such a time as this who who's going to say yes who's going to say yes to god and and pray and be a prayer warrior like like we've had in this church over the past 
those those altar services that have been talked about those were so special yes time spent in prayer times waiting on God and tell and sometimes until the answer was there and we don't always get the answer but we need to pray first Chronicles 7 14 you know it well if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I hear from heaven and will heal their land he says they'll heal their land. But we have to humble ourselves and pray. And we have to pray for, as we're praying for our country. Lastly, remember the call to salvation. The call to salvation, the most important thing that we, that we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. What does the word say? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. I mentioned that to somebody today, the power of the word but in the word of God. It seems that it, just about every time you see the word but, God is going to do something. God, God does something for His honor and His glory. I don't know if Pastor Vinsky, I told Pastor Vinsky I was his warm up tonight, his warm up tonight. If, if, that certainly, if, if, if he does have an altar call, and I'm sure that Probably everybody here is saved and is on his way to heaven. I mean, only the Lord knows that, right? But the call to, for salvation and to God be the glory. We're celebrating what God has done in the last hundred years and is still doing. My challenge is to 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 remember the call think about that and maybe that'll be something that you can remember uh, that will stick with you remember the call remember the call to ministry to the word to prayer to salvation to god be the glory to god be the glory sing with me great gang has done so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the honor of, of asking me to speak. I, like I say, I'm not long-winded. I hope, hope that I've left you with some reminders. Thank you.
I left off with um, Pastor Dave Jan. You'll have to look at the video, I guess, anyway. Uh, but anyway, that's where I left off last night. And thank you for firing that wood stove, helping Dave with the wood stove, anyway. And, uh, that was one of the bottlenecks I talked about in the church last night, and uh, the Lundstroms were uh, the last to get in on it. After Pastor Dave uh, stepped down and took a business over in Brainerd, uh, the Hills came. Lois, uh, a farm girl from Wisconsin, and uh, her husband Joe came, and uh, spiritual people, people of prayer, <coughs> and the church continued to grow while they were, it really never, never really let up. Uh, I would say there was solid growth from the time of uh, Leroy Nelson. Sometimes it would flatten out a little bit, but it, it kept ramping up. And uh, we were doing great. Uh, but you know, sometimes um, the pastor and the leadership hit a little bit of a, a rough patch, I guess I would call it. And uh, the only time that I've been on board that uh, we, we drew upon uh, the leadership of the district to help us work through that and praise God for um, good spiritual leadership accountability brother Clarence St. John came West Bogley and walked us through that and got us to a better place I think that took us to um, maybe 96 or oh, I should say one other uh, bottleneck was um the gravel road. People with nice cars uh, don't like the sound of that gravel hitting the bottom of their rocker panels on their on their vehicles. And we had two miles of gravel, and it usually didn't get real money, but it gave us dirty cars. Some of us are used to that, uh, but others uh, that. And I'd like to try to keep their cars nice. I think probably a few people thought, man, I don't know if I want to wash my car twice a week or whatever. So uh, we finally got it through. I think it was during Brother Hill's tenure that we got a tar road up to the church. And that was a great day because that's something that we've been fighting. I still remember. Uh, of course, when you're farming alongside of it, you see what's going on. And I still remember <coughs> Tom Horn on prom night. He had that car just spotless and beautiful. And he he crept all the way up and down the gravel road at about 15 miles an hour just to keep that thing right. But anyway, from there on, we had talk to the church. What a blessing that was. Another bottleneck, and we had good piano players. I shared a little bit about one question would always be to the new pastor and his wife, his wife, uh, do you play piano? They would usually say, oh, a little, and, and usually that's what it was. But we had a, a couple of um, older ladies that didn't do too bad. Ruth Carlson actually was, a, was pretty good, but she preferred the organ. Uh, but anyway, uh, a new family came to the church in 1996, and uh, they had just moved into the area, and they were sitting in the overflow, I remember, and uh, somebody said to the Ramses, do you play piano? And Mike got a funny look on his face, and she plays a little. <laughs> he lied. He lied. 
When she got behind the piano, I would say, a bit of a bottleneck opened up, and that allowed us to move to the next level uh, with the music here at church. And praise God for that, praise God for that. Mike Broberg. We had kind of a, it was a little bit of a difficult situation. We had two great candidates that wanted to come here and the first vote was really tight, but the first vote, the, the guy didn't quite make it. We pulled in Mike Broberg and he got voted in. I remember right out here when when he uh, when I first met him, he, they pulled up to the church, and I was in the parking lot, and he was just coming out of his car, and I knew he was 49 years old, um, but he was fixing his tie and had that crooked grin on his face when he was getting out. And, uh, I thought to myself kind of a young looking 49 and you know he just clicked we had this rodeo out here today I was I was thinking about him then um, there was just a lot of different hats that he could wear that connected with people and of course the horse people loved him the Royal Ranger Missionettes program uh, grew because of you know, his push on that, um, he could go down, he loved going down to like the Elray and uh, lots of times we would go down there and he'd love to talk to people uh, at the counter there about farming or anything, but he always really didn't want me to tell him that he was the pastor, I remember. Uh, but anyway, right away, I think, we knew we were moving to a new level as far as people. It was getting really crowded up there. One, one time we came up with a, a scheme, not really a scheme. We both felt that God wanted us to build, and several other people did here too. Um, so we came up with a plan as far as presenting it to the people. Uh, we took some pictures. Uh, we went down to my dairy barn, took some pictures. We deliberately kind of overstocked uh, a pen of cows, put the feed out, and there was people that, or cows that couldn't get to the feed. And so we took pictures of them, you know, waiting in line, not being able to eat. And then we happened to have a great crowd the next Sunday, and we took pictures, and I remember the Bob LaFlex family was in the back with not quite enough space to even get in the pew, so we had set up some chairs, but it was very overcrowded, and so we kind of likened uh, the two together and kind of did a presentation on, the, on slides anyway. And, uh, the people, they, they, they were on board. They were on board, but we didn't know how to do it, there was different ideas. Some people thought we should go to the north. North. Some people thought we should go to the west. Uh, none of them seemed quite right. One day right after church, Kurt and I were talking and we were talking about that problem and well, Kurt says, well maybe we should move the road. And I said, maybe we should move the road. <laughs> Nobody ever built a church in the middle of a road before, but anyway, we thought maybe it could be done. The township was talked to. Um, we, it, it cost us some money, but we got the ability to move the road. Dan Martin had the pasture and donated some more land to make that work. I thought it was quite interesting when we went to move the road. John Sullivan uh, from the Brainerd Church had equipment. He had Robin Bethel working for him. 
when he dropped that blade into the ground and started going, he ran into a foundation. And it was the foundation of the old Woodman Hall. And that was the last evidence of that, of that building. So right now, the road goes over where that foundation was. This church is in the road. And we did end up building to the north, but not, not for several years. And that's, of course, going on right now. Of course, it was talked about, Karen, you did a great job last Sunday night, let me tell you, um, covering what we went through as a church uh, when Mike got sick. We'd always had young pastors here, except for Loyal Miller, and he was in better shape than most young, young pastors. But uh, we had uh, somebody that was facing a life-threatening illness. That was new territory for us. We never had to deal with that before. Um, but God walked us through it. It was a Difficult time, a, t a difficult year for everybody, but um, it changed us. It changed us for the better. And I like what Karen said. When you go through something like that, the church doesn't argue about the color of the carpet. And that's exactly right. You see the bigger picture on things. And, you know, God gave us the grace to get through that. And, and, the Burl Briggs as well, as difficult as it was. Youth pastors. We started paying youth pastors. Uh, I think John Langer was the first one that was hired from the Brainerd Church. Um, and I I didn't write down a list on that. I, I know that, um, of course, Richard last night talked about it. Dennis Moon, uh, he was a paid youth pastor, but he gave all the money back. <laughs> and, but we went on, you know, of course, since then we've continued uh, to hire youth pastors. That was probably also a bottleneck that was taken care of. One of the youth pastors that we hired was a young man by the name of Dan Johnson. And, well, God's will, God's hand was in that. A builder, a servant leader. I don't know how many times I come up here and there's Dan Johnson pushing snow. What an example that he's given to us. And I think maybe Mike Broberg before was the longest tenure, but Dan and Karen have definitely blown away that record, and uh, we thank God for every year. I started talking about spiritual battles when 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 we started this series. Have they ended? Of course not. The Woodman Hall can come back won't look like the old Woodman Hall. But what are we going to look like in 2050? Our young adults now are playing volleyball out here on Tuesday nights. What if a, a sports bar oops, a sports bar starts up down the road and you know, you can play volleyball there and, and with some Mike's Hard Lemonade and have maybe more fun, some people would say. It can happen. It can happen. It can only happen, though, if that demand is there. The Woodman Hall lasted for 50 years. And the only reason that it failed, got torn down, was because 
the young people lost interest. They had an alternative that they went to instead. We have to continue to do that as a church. We have to offer that alternative of truth that the world doesn't have. As long as we do that, until Jesus comes, the Casino Church will be a force. I want to thank you for listening to this series. And as has been being said, to God be the glory.
They, they do this. Everybody do that. So the next time your wife or husband is doing something foolish, so. okay, you have, you have permission to do that. I, I might be a little foolish. That's because I'm getting older. Maybe. Okay. Let's let's pray for our our kids and our teachers and our schools. Let's pray for America. Okay, can we do that? We'll, we won't take a long time. Let's pray, Father. We need you. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. As that old Bible expression says, Maranatha means come, Lord Jesus. Lord, we need you. Come. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now stay up here. Brother Bruce, where's Brother Bruce? Is he here or is he in the history room? Brother Bruce, I need you right now. It's, it's right now. And I need you to find a good farmer, a good dairy farmer. It can be any anybody you want, a good dairy farmer. It can be retired. Okay. Not yourself. This this is this is Brother James Menzies. Come, come and stand down on the end here. Now you call you call out a dairy farmer to come and join you. Okay, come on, come on, come on. You are Frank Lindquist. Uh oh, oh. No, wait a minute, I got you two turned around, didn't I? <laughs> I want you up there. Yeah, no, no. But I think I'm gonna make I'm gonna make you wear the hat because you're gonna be Frank Lindquist and this is James Menzies. Okay, all right. Your dad gets to wear the hat. I know he's he's got the perfect do. I hate to have it get messed up, but you're well made. You do anything for Jesus? Amen. How many of you did anything for Jesus he asked you to do? Okay. Even, even, okay, super. All right. So, I don't have 24 people here, but I just want to give you the picture of all of these pastors that have come before. Now, I have a sermon that's about nine pages long. I'm not going to preach tonight. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, and Tammy, I got your list, but it didn't tell me how long I'm supposed to preach it. It says 26, it says, whatever that means. 26 o'clock? That's military time? I don't know. And, uh, anyway. Yeah, no, I, I won't be long, I guarantee you. Did all my grandkids come up? Except for Marty. Where's Marty? She didn't come up. Okay. Every night when Matthew is going to bed, I pray a prayer with him. And, uh, and I mention all of our family members in prayer because I think it's important to pray for everybody in our family or relationship or churches. And so, but, but you know, sometimes you're in a hurry because you, you need to get in the other room and get a drink of water or otherwise. And so my prayer goes a little bit, a little bit like this. God bless Matthew, Mom and Dad and Candy, Sarah, Daniel, Bill, Lily, Eva, Manny, Mari, uh, um, Amy, Patrick, Keelan, Kai, and Daniel in Spain, and Grandma Norman's and all of our family and friends and uncles and aunts and uncles. And, uh, and yeah, something like that. But Matthew knows it means we're praying for our family and we need to pray for our families. Amen? Okay, so, um, did you know I'm getting older, Gail? <laughs> it's better than the alternative. Okay. Pastor, could you come and join us up here? Pastor Dan, told me on the phone the other day, he said, Pastor, I want you to know I'm standing on your shoulders. Now get that mental picture in your mind. <laughs> now I wanted to form a pyramid tonight of all the pastors that have been here before, <laughs> but I didn't think it'd be very good, but I think let's just practice, let's pass, pass the authority from, from one end to the other. So just as we're doing that, just think of the pastor. So go ahead and pass the hat to the next person. Everybody has to wear it for a moment, okay? All right. 
See, it's big enough for everybody, because it fits me. <laughs> I can't wait till it gets to me. Okay, he knows how to wear it. Hold it back a little bit. <laughs> okay, and there have been women in ministry here, right? Yeah, Helen and Shirley. Was Shirley a man or a woman? I think it was a woman. Was it a man? Shirley was a man? Okay. Sounded like a woman's name. He's not here to get mad at us. So. Uh, okay. Uh, so, Pastor Dan, have you ever worn a hat like that? Not like this. Okay. Here we go. Let's let's applaud the man of God who is now in the Holy Spirit. Let's applaud all these young people as they go down and sit back down in their church. Thank you, guys. And I want to have that, by the way. Thank you. I'd love to give it to you, but my wife gave it to me for a present, so. All right. I'm going to just say a few words tonight. I'm, I'm really not going to go too long. Um, I want to thank Pastor Dan and Karen for allowing us to come and be part of this celebration. I did write this part so I wouldn't mess it up too bad. Um, thank you for their children, Jessalyn, Ezra, and Julia. I thought it was Julie, but Julia. And the beat goes on. The beat goes on. We watched all the services beginning from last Sunday, my wife and I, and I admit we're jealous of your ability on live streaming your services. Now, notice I said jealous. I didn't say envious because that's against the Word of God. Okay. <laughs> We can be jealous, but not envious, okay? I'm pulling your leg, okay? Just don't be envious or jealous of others, okay? I'm impressed with how you and your anniversary team have put together this, uh, this all this together. I understand much of the history is the celebrated suite was saved and assembled by Bruce Gordon Martin. I know that uh, from my own experience that there are many other people behind the scenes, including Gail and Julie, uh, the, the wives, um, I know that the whole Martin family has been involved. Uh, I know that the, the, the pictures from, uh, from the Petersons that uh, were saved over the years were very valuable in the uh, history room. And uh, thank you all of you that have, have put effort and energy into this, including the wonderful rodeo today. I think we should give everybody a hand for the wonderful rodeo. <laughs> If you weren't here, you missed the Bucking Broncos and the, uh, the, the Wild uh, Bulls, but because uh, they weren't here. <laughs> All right. um, I, I want to thank the worship leaders who have been providing all this great music. I especially enjoyed the one song, Hogan's Heroes. Or whosoever be the theme. <laughs> All right. They said it, I didn't. They, they brought it up. Once in a while, I hear a song, they'll tell my wife, and say, What's that song? I, said, I don't care. <laughs> well, I, I want to know who, who sang it and when they sang it, and I just like details like that. And, and I always enjoyed Hogan's Heroes on Saturday night. That was one of my favorites. Um, I asked Bruce if I could bring a snake to church tonight. <laughs> He said I could if it was rubber. Yeah. But I heard, uh, is Ruthie here? Ruthie Holberg? Okay. She, she talked, if you, if you weren't here, go back and watch the video. She went to a snake handling church where the pastor had been bitten 13 times, I think it was, and had almost died once. And his dad, who was a previous pastor, died from a snake bite. Crazy things. You, but you won't know much about it unless you go back and get out of much of the videos, okay? And get the t-shirt. Mm. <laughs> uh, and and so I enjoyed Ruthie. Ruthie uh, did a great job because she forgot her notes at the motel. That's not why she did a great job, but uh, she did a great job without the notes. And uh, she did have a wonderful PowerPoint that was playing behind the, the speaker. Uh, <coughs> 
I, I enjoyed uh, Ed, uh, Ted Jensen. Um, I, I never knew his story before. I guess, you know, Gail, I'm getting old, I forget things. I'm sure Gordon told me that story about Ted Jensen many times, but it's been a while. I just I forget, you know. But uh, if you don't know that story, you gotta go back and listen to Ted Jensen. You gotta listen to him. And you gotta listen to the former youth pastor as he, as he talked. And, and they all had a good message from God. The Hound of Heaven. The Hound of Heaven. I never read that. But I've heard about it over the years. And he talked about the Hound of Heaven and how no matter how far you get away from God, there'll be a place where you can come back. There'll be a place where God is waiting for you to come back. Um, well, and then I, then I have a note here. Talk about what Leonard Manichek said tonight. <laughs> it was really good. Okay, next. <laughs> it was really good, but I, I don't have time to go elaborate, okay? Uh, and tomorrow is going to be a great time of personal sharing in Sunday school. And I hear that the pastor's wives are encouraged to speak there. The rest of the week they were told not to. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wendy, do you want to say anything? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Are we going to be here tomorrow morning? Okay, well, if we are, then she'll, she'll be here for Sunday school, I think. 10 o'clock. Okay. 9.30. Bruce, 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 you gave me the wrong time. No, 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 it's 10.30. Thank you, Dan. You're so forgiving. We have each other's back, right? Just don't stand on mine. <laughs> oh, man. And, and what a wonderful food that was provided this afternoon and that's been provided tomorrow. I guess it's going to be a, a great chicken dinner. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. You said don't tell everybody. Because it's, it's all provided. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, I'm just going to give you a little background of our journey. And also, I just, I just want to hit a couple highlights of the beginning of this church. First of all, I, I think I'm the person that discovered where the name Casino really came from. Now, I kept asking Bruce and Gordon and Calvin and everybody, said, do you really know where the name came from? And so every time I was in the library or every time you wouldn't have internet back then, this was back in 1982, 40 years ago, my wife and I came to this church right after the anniversary the 60th anniversary, so we're here 40 years later. Gordon hasn't aged a bit. But I remember shortly after I came to the church, he said, a testimony service. He said, yeah, I'm 50 years old now and I can't pull myself up in the hay anymore. <laughs> he always could pull himself up, just grab up there and pull himself up. And he said, I'm 15, I can't do it anymore. See, I remember some things, the, the good things. There's always been a ladder. At our, at our barn, I grew up on a dairy farm, there was always a ladder, and I never saw anybody just go up on their own with, without a ladder. But apparently, this man did. So, at least that's what he told us. All right. I was, I was at North Central, and I was, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I, Started out as a music major, and then I changed to a pastoral major. But I didn't have anyone in my family to tell me how to become a pastor. Like, how do you apply to be a pastor? How do you get your credentials? That, that wasn't, nobody in North Central was telling me that. And a friend of mine came alongside me one day and said, you know, you, you need to apply. You need to apply. So I, so I applied to get my credentials, and I went through the process, and they told me, they said, uh, we, we've approved you. So I went to the credentialing service and I found out I was approved to be a Sunday school teacher, basically. I got Christian workers' papers. So they so didn't approve me as a minister. And I was really embarrassed because my family all came to see me be licensed as a minister and I was only a Christian worker. They didn't tell me that. But they recognized that I wasn't in active ministry yet and I needed to really be in active ministry before they wanted to credential me. So. Long story short, eventually that did happen. But, but anyway, um, at the first church we were at, we, we were asked to come to uh, Stillwater to just to kind of help out. 
And my brother was the, the children's pastor at the time, so I helped out with children's church and Sunday school and music and things. But right, right when I first came to the church, they there had had a funeral. It had been one of the biggest funerals they'd ever had in the church. And the funeral was for William Whitman, who was one of the founding members of this church when they became a Sunday of God church in 1928 or 25, whatever, 25, I think. William Whitman was one of those, and he he was been come, come to the church there, and he had just passed away before I came. So I had a connection with Casino. The reason I have a connection with, with Casino was because his wife was grieving the loss of her husband. And so one of the first jobs I had was to make sure to visit Violet Whitman on a regular basis. And that's where I learned to drink coffee. Because when you go to Violet's house and she offers you coffee, you drink coffee. I never drank coffee before. <laughs> I kind of like it, you know. <laughs> but but um, my parents didn't teach us to drink coffee. Okay. So, so I had that early connection with the church because when we were starting to look for a church, when we, when we finally were feeling like God was leading us to, to, to make a change, and I applied to all the open churches that were in the state at the time. One of them was Casino. And guess who put in a good word for me from Stillwater all the way back to Casino? Wyland Whitman. He drinks coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Among other things, I, I guess she liked me a little bit. And uh, interesting fact, Violet's son, oh, Paul, are you here tonight? There it is. Paul, would you get up? We gotta, we gotta congratulate you for, for all of the years your family has served God. <laughs> God <let's go. laughs> okay. Paul and Bill were both living in Stillwater, and uh, Bill was part of the church, Bill Jr. And uh, Bill and Ida became very good friends of ours because I'd go to visit Violet and Bill and Ida shared the uh, duplex with them. So we get, I get to see Bill and Ida all the time. And even though Bill was a trucker and I didn't see him a lot, but he was there. And then 30 some years later, about 30 years later, we go to Moose Lake Church and guess who two of the people in the church are? Bill and Ida Whitman. So the continuation of the blessing of God. And you're going you're gonna to see that as you start to search around your community. You're going to find people that have connections from your past. Um, so number one, I, want to, I just want to say God is good. Some, some of you old timers will say all the time, and he is. God is good. Well, you don't have to say that. I just put with that so long the time to say. If you said, just said that, you become an old timer. Okay. And uh, not old timers, old timer. Okay. And I thought maybe Jen would be here tonight and she could be one of the teachers going with uh, Carrie around the church, but uh, didn't make it tonight. That's all right. She's probably out there watching. Uh, Anyway, I want, I want to share a scripture with you. This is the only scripture I'm going to focus on for like, I'm just going to read through the scripture. This is what I believe the Lord gave me to share with you tonight. And they gave me this about a week ago. Psalm 145. So if you don't remember anything I said tonight, remember 145. How do you remember that? I'm always into numbers and trying to remember numbers. Because I'm terrible at remembering numbers, so I'm always trying. So um, you can think of 14.5. You can think of 1 and 45. You can think of anything you want, but try to remember Psalm 145, okay? So I, I don't know. Is it your 45th anniversary? You can think 145. I, I don't know, but re I think you need to read this. Um, I will exalt you, O King, O God. And with gratitude and submission and wonder, will bless your name forever and ever. I'm reading from the Amplified Version, so there's a few extra words, but it's wonderful. Joyce Myers uses it, and so do other good preachers, okay? I'm one of them. Okay. Every day I will bless you and lovingly praise you. Yes, with awe-inspired reverence, I will 
Praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is so vast and profound as to be unreachable, uncomprehendable to man. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty and remarkable acts. I didn't read the whole thing. But one generation shall praise to the next. Melissa knows the word of God. She has heard the word of God from her grandparents, from her parents, from her teachers, from her pastors. And even though she may not seem to comprehend it all, she does. And when we all get to heaven and we're all free to run and roam any way we want, she's going to be just as, just as alert as anybody there. Because the good news was passed on from her grandparents and her parents and her aunts and her uncles and, and even people like Daryl and Janet. Daryl and Janet met my mom and dad before they came to the casino. So they came here, we already had a connection. And uh, he was the first paid youth leader. Remember we'd give you free coffee sometimes? <laughs> and I, I heard later there was another woman that was a, was a uh, youth pastor, so I don't know if he's related to you guys. But, okay. <laughs> okay. God will always take care of us. God is good. He will always take care of us. I think I'm just going to end, and I don't, I don't know how I'm going to, what I'm going to do exactly, because I told my wife I was really excited to hear the preacher tonight, both Leonard and me, you know, because I, I don't know what I'm going to say, and sometimes that's the way it works, but um, one thing I learned over the years is that God is speaking all the time. God wants to speak to you tonight. He wants to speak to me tonight. Any of you remember Nimrod Anderson, the evangelist? Okay. Did, did you say Jim Ackerson is, tonight, is here tonight? Jim Ackerson is here? That's Jim. There he is. Jim, i got a story to tell about you about bananas in a moment. Okay, so if I forget, remind me about Jim and his bananas. Um, but when I, was, when I was young in the church and, and growing up, um, I thought the pastor knew everything about me. I thought, Pastor Dan, when you were up front leading your congregation, you can read everybody's mind. I know what he's thinking. I know what she's thinking. I really thought that. And it scared me to death because I didn't have a pure mind. And I thought, you know, I really, you know what I really thought? And this, I've never admitted this before to anybody, okay? I thought one of these days the pastor's going to bring out a chorus line dancer right in front of the church to see how we respond. Because I would probably get turned on by that. Horse girl when I was a teenager. I never said that before, and my wife is never going to forgive me. No, not sure. <laughs> but we all, we, all, we all know that we're not pure, we, we're not perfect, and so, but we're trying, and, and, and God bless you. People like Jack Schwatka, 26 years of sobriety. Give him a hand. He said, sadly, most of the people in his support group are, have only been there five years or they've been there four years and then four years and then four years and then because they, they relapse. But, but his faithfulness to God and his faithfulness to, to try. How many of you ever feel like giving up? Come on, Terry. You must have felt like that at some point, right? I'm sorry, I'm picking on Terry because he was part of our congregation and pastor in the Pillager Church. Uh, that's a miracle in itself because uh, I'm going to get back to you, Jim. Um, <laughs> squirrel. When my daughter Amy started school, we were pastoring a casino. We left after a few years, and uh, she was starting third, second, or third grade. Third grade. And six years later, we came back to the community and we pastored the Villager Church. And, and, and she was back in the school again. And a couple of few years later, she graduated. And the very young man who walked with her in kindergarten graduation was also walking with her 
in high school graduation, and they ended up getting married. Let's give them a hand. That's pretty amazing. And yes, he did ask permission, guys. You need to ask permission from the dads. That's, that's important. Okay. Um, and you know who led that kindergarten graduation? This is fun. This is fun. Who led that kindergarten graduation that year? Dennis Timmerman. Any of you remember Dennis Timmerman? When we left the church here and we moved to Wells, guess where Pastor Timmerman had moved to when he left Pillager? He had moved to Wells. So we got to be with him for six years here and then for another six years there. I just talked to him on the phone the other day, this good Lutheran pastor, good man of God, his wife, and Jane, and I remember Jane, and he said, I wish we could come, but because of the pandemic, our whole family has been like quarantining themselves. And he said, we haven't been in a church service for since the pandemic started. They've been doing Zoom meetings and things, but no, no in. Pray for America. There's a lot of people that are afraid, there are a lot of people that are scared, a lot of people that are homebound. Yeah. Okay, anybody that's really bored right now, stand up real quick. All right, I guess you're okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, my, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so, I didn't introduce, my whole entire family is here today. Becky as well, and Alan, and, and Gordon and Gail, they're, they're part of our family. You're all part of our family. But uh, you don't have to stand, guys, but just, just put your hand up in the air real quick, everybody. Just wave your hand if you're related to me. Or you, or, <laughs> why, yeah, we were talking today about how, you know, the only reason Daniel and, and uh, Patrick, <laughs> I remember his name. The only reason Daniel and Patrick are, are related to us is because they married into the family. I mean, that's simple stuff, yeah, but we've got to remind ourselves once in a while. Uh, no, they're wonderful. I, I'm so thankful for them. Yeah. And that they obeyed the protocol. Okay, they asked permission. Uh, oh, man. Oh, Jim. Also, you have to tell us why, what casino. I didn't tell you. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so I, I went to, thank you. This is a participation service. You're welcome to join at any time. Anybody. Um, even my grandkids. Yeah, uh, I went to a library in Little Falls or Long Prairie. Do you remember which it was? Either Little Falls or Long Prairie, and my wife and I were there. She knew it would take a while because I always just like to sit and go through books. And I found this old history book, History of Minnesota, and it said way back in the day, they were having trouble with mail delivery. Right, like right around the end of the 1800s, mail delivery between two towns. The two towns were Cass and Cass Lake because the names were so similar, you know, Cass and Cass Lake. So Cass chose to change their name to Casino. Now, that's the only document I've ever seen that said that, and so now it's going to die with me because I don't know where that book is. But, but that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, and to me, that's a good story. That's, you know, I didn't like the idea it came from the gambling at the casino at Wood, 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 Woodland Hall. Woodward Hall? Wood, 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 Woodman. Woodman Hall. Um, but I, I don't doubt that that was part of it. Because they already had gambling in the community, they said, well, let's just change it from cast to casino because there was also gambling going on at the Woodman Hall. Yeah. So that answer your question? Yeah. So if someone ever finds that, please, you know, send it to me. I, I would love to find that written down document. But Jim, 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 Jim was one of our favorite people in the church. One of your first pastors to have his own car was Frank Gottwald. No. Fred. There we go. I remember. Fred Gottwald. I, I didn't forget Fred and Alma. They're, they're an important part of our lives. And Fred was one of the first ones to get a car and to be able to drive from Pillager, I think, up this way to do <coughs> services. Because before that, they, were, they would walk 10 miles to come to church. And one day, 
Fred Gottwald was driving to church, and he drove right past um, Jim. Could have picked him up, probably, but I don't know why. Maybe he was just going for Sunday tea or something. I don't know, but but he splashed water all over Jim. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. But you forgave him, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, deliverance tonight. We did it. We did it. Uh, but Jim was a prankster, and he still probably is. I got a letter in the mail. I got a letter in the mail from the White House. And I no, I had sent a letter to uh, President Reagan telling him I appreciate the work he was doing, telling him that we were praying for him. And I got a letter back. I got a picture of him riding on a horse, which I was so impressed. I mean, it could have been a press secretary that did all this, but, but it was a signed letter from the president typed out thanking me for his, our support. And, uh, and so I mentioned in church, and uh, a few years later, I'll get back to Jim. <laughs> a few years later, when, uh, when uh, uh, George Bush Jr., George W. Bush was president, I sent him a letter, and I also got a letter back thanking us for our prayers, our support. <laughs> Again, don't know if it was his real signature or anything like that, but boy, we need to pray for our country, don't we? Pray for our leaders, no matter how good or bad they are, pray for them. Because God, God loves America, and God wants us to pray for America. But anyway, back to Jim. A couple days after I got a letter from President Reagan, and I mentioned it in church on Sunday, I got another letter in the mail from the White House. <coughs> from Jim Ackerson. Because <laughs> they lived, Jim and Lita lived in a, in a White House. And just wanted to let me know that uh, he was thinking about us. <laughs> so I believe God can speak to us. Jim, Jim R. Anderson taught us, evangelists, that God is speaking all the time. He just wants us to take time to listen, right, Gary? Gary, are you listening to me? Okay. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> Gary, Gary, we were talking about you this afternoon, that how uh, you you and, and Carrie met. And uh, I, I remember, um, yeah, um, that guy back there that spoke her to Leonard. We were, we were talking about you guys. And I said, you know, the first time, the, he, had, he invited them to the church, the Esmeth family, and that's, I think, how, maybe how you guys met or got more connected than just fellowship meetings. Well, anyway, I got to ask Gary to speak at a men's breakfast over in Staples one day. And that was the first time he, he did public speaking. So between the two of us, we made him a successful minister. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you, Gary, for hanging in there and continuing the work. And Gary for putting up with him. No, no, I for Oh, wonderful. you guys are wonderful people. I have no idea how, they didn't tell me how long I could speak, but I'm going to, oh, getting back to Jim. <laughs> God is so good. One, one day when we were in Wells, we pastored in Wells, well, and, and by the way, when we came to Wells, did you know it was a God thing for us? Not that we had to leave casino, because we loved you guys, okay? This man of God hears from God, okay? One day he said to me, he didn't even know he was hearing from God. One day after we'd been here about six years, he said, Pastor, it's okay if you ever think about leaving the church. senior pastor, and I didn't know how to ever leave. I thought I had to stay here forever, you know? I hear you know, these successful pastors preached for 30, 40 years the same church. But so you freed me up. And we started sending out resumes. Now, he wasn't telling us we were bad, he just was telling us, you can do that. He was teaching me. And, no, and it, I don't laugh. No, this was serious. It really meant a lot to me that he said that. And uh, so I put out these 
put out advertisements to the different churches, what they call resumes. And uh, we got a call from a little church, Eagle Bend. So we went to try out there. But you know what was happening the day we were there? It was a Saturday, I think a Saturday night we were going to meet with the board. Land Lakes was having their meeting, a big meeting in, in Eagle Bend. I don't know what kind of meeting it was, but they, we were so afraid Gordon was going to see us there and, and report that we were checking out other churches. And, and whenever I left the church, I, I like to... I like to be a little secretive about it because I didn't want people to get upset until until we knew what was going on, you know. But but no, I don't know if you I never found out if you were there, but I was worried you were gonna see our car in the hotel parking lot and and, and rat us out. But, uh, how many of you have ever been blessed by someone else giving you food? Okay? Yeah. When you need food, pastors always need food. Because we're we, we have to eat to maintain our energy, you know. I, I've actually lost about 80 pounds in the last four years. Had cancer and COVID, <laughs> and uh, so it wasn't something I did, but God did. Okay. Um, oh, back to the bananas. We'll get, we'll get no, but while we were thinking about where we needed to go, Wendy said to me, "I think we were at family camp at the time." She said. You think we should send a, uh, a resume to Wells because we knew that Wells was open, and we had some people. We had some connection with Wells because uh, there were people in the Jubilee Steam group I used to be in that were, were in Wells. And she said, "Well, let's let's ask God for a sign. Can you can you refresh us on what happened there?" Well, anyway, so she said, "Let's pray that God will have somebody mention Wells to us." So we went to get in the lunch line. There was a couple in line there. And I don't, you know, I don't, it probably wasn't Wendy, it was probably me, because I'm kind of a talker. I said, where are you guys from? Wells. <laughs> wasn't long after that we saw Paul Scraybeck, who was from Wells. And it was kind of like God was saying, yeah, put your resume in there. And, and that was where God chose to send us next. God's, God's been so good. And God's been so good to have you listen to me tonight so far. We're going to get back to the bananas now. <laughs> People run with bananas. I believe God wants to speak to us. One day Wendy was, was in the living room and she said, God, if I just had $61, I could pay the rest of the bills. Because she was really good about paying bills. But I had just 61 more dollars. This was in Wells. And... Uh, just like that. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Okay. There's a knock on the door, and it's one of the ladies in church. She said, here. And she hands Wendy $61. Wendy called her up and said, why did you do that, Candy? Candy said, well, I was washing dishes, and God told me to bring you $61. So here it is. She said, I knew we didn't have $61 in the house, so I took everything I had, and I came up with $60. And I went out to the car and I started the car and God said, what did I say? $61. She went back in the house, broke into one of the piggy banks of one of the kids and got the rest of the money <laughs> and brought it to the house. Another day, Wendy was just thinking about the goodness of God and she had a bowl she had just washed and was putting it on the table and she said, it would sure be nice to have some fruit to put in this bowl. Another lady in the church. Say, I was just at the grocery store and I don't know why, but I bought all this extra fruit. Would you like some fruit? <laughs> so, back to Jim. <laughs> One day I said to, are there any of the horns here, by the way? Any horn family? Oh, there they are. Bless you guys. Bless you. I, I was, uh, this related to the bananas. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to tell one more story and then we'll finish the banana story. Um, Fred Gobble told us that when he came to the church the first time, one of the very first Sundays he was there, and uh, probably, is this the same basic wall or the location of the old wall of the church, or did it get moved out further? Oh, it was over there. Okay, yeah. Okay. 
he said they were uh, starting the service, and this would have been when the church was was on, on, on by uh, by uh, Elvin's place, Elvin Martin, and Elvin Florence. And uh, by the way, do you know why Elvin is called Elvin? Because he was the eleventh child, Elvin Martin, eleventh child. Crazy. Okay. Back to the bananas. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Um, I lost the train of thought for a moment. Let's finish the banana story. You're waiting to hear this with bated breath. So one day I said, Wendy, I don't know why, but I'm just really hungry for crab legs. Now the only crab legs we have ever eaten are mock crab legs, not the real thing with the mock ones. In fact, years later I made them at the Mali fish factory. I, I, I made the uh, at the seafood plant there, I, I made mock crab legs. And, but I said, I'm hungry for that. I'd only had them like once or twice in my life, and I'm just hungry. I said it right then. I don't know what I said, but I, I was hungry. <laughs> David Horn, part of the family that started this church years and years ago, David Horn, one of the descendants. There's another one back there. Tim, not Tom, because I was getting confused. Tim. I think Tom was the original Horn. I think was Dad the dad Tom. I don't remember what the dad's name was. The original dad. We had ten kids and one daughter. Yeah. Okay. My wife said, "Hurry up." Okay. We gotta get back to the bananas. So to knock at the door, and here's David, and he says. Say, yep. that's what you say in Minnesota. Say, could you use some mock crab legs? We had like five pounds of mock crab legs. I'm, I'm talking to you tonight not about how God favored me, but how much God loves you. Uh, if you trust God, God will come through for you. If you ask God, if you're praying for unsaved loved ones, and I know some of you have unsaved loved ones, and just keep holding them up before God. Don't get angry at God. Don't get angry at the devil. Oh, well, well, that's okay. You can do that one. But, but pray and believe for God to intervene. Pray and believe. Pray and believe. And uh, I'm on that track, going in the other direction. So David gave us my crab legs. I mentioned it in church. And just a few days later, the road grader pulled up next to the house. And Jim was there. Say, you couldn't happen to use some bananas, could you? <laughs> and I had to say, I wasn't thinking about that. But, <laughs> but thank you anyway. Jim, Jim, Jim believes in down to earth stuff. How many of you believe in down to earth stuff? We don't, we don't want crazy stuff, but we want God's stuff. Amen. And I, I just want to tell you that God is, God is speaking. God is wanting to minister to us. And I think I'm going to end with this. I have all this history. I've got all the people in the community I want to talk about, and all the pastors that we used to know in the area. But I want to, I want to bring it down. To this, a couple couple months ago, one of our parishioners at our church in Moose Lake, he's in his 60s, if not early 70s, and his wife passed away last year from cancer, and he got married over the winter while he was in Arizona, or he got married, yeah, right, right, at, right at Easter time. Wonderful young, younger lady than his, his former wife, but Wonderful lady, wonderful woman of God. And God is using her to speak to people. God will speak to her and she'll say, okay, and she'll tell people stuff that God has shown her. We call that prophetic. But did you know every time your pastor preaches, he's being prophetic? Because he's speaking what God wants you to hear. So whether it be somebody coming to you and say, John, 3.16, or they say Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, 
or they say some other scripture, you know, Psalm 100, it means a lot to you. That's wonderful if God tells them to do that for you. But I want you to know every Sunday your pastor is hearing from God and telling you what God wants you to hear that particular Sunday. If, if we didn't believe that, we wouldn't be doing this, would we? We, God, God has this, we, you know, this is secret. No, no one else knows about this. God has a cell phone he gives to pastors. And we have direct communication, right? Well, no, no, we don't. But we know in our spirit that God has spoken. And, and, and Pastor Manichek talked about an altar call tonight. And I, I'm not going to give an altar call, but I'm going to say, if you want to hear from God, ask God to speak to you. And if he chooses to send a 10-year-old all over to you to say, I don't know why, but I think I'm supposed to tell you this. You better be willing to listen. This lady came to me one day, and I've been passing this on ever since. I passed it on all over camp this summer, family camp. She said, one of the ladies in our church, another new lady, she said, Pastor, I feel like we're supposed to pray for you. This is a Bible study night. So the people gathered around me, and they prayed for me. I wasn't sick. I wasn't being... I've always got ailments, but you know, I just, I'm just thankful for the prayers. Pray, pray for this guy. Would you please pray for him and his family? You know, they they covet your prayers. They won't they won't be envious, but they'll covet your prayers, okay? And so she said, let's pray for the pastor. They prayed for the pastor when we we're done. Carol, this new lady in the church, she said, Pastor, God's training me to speak up. And God has given me just a few words to give to you, but I know when I give them to you that he's going to give me more. And he said, by my hand, I have placed you where you are. Keep going forward, don't go to the right or to the left. That spoke to me. Let it speak to you. Every one of you. Huh? Yeah, the pastor, God put him here for a purpose and for a time and a place just, just when you needed him and when God needed him here. And God has placed you, Gary, and Gary where you are. Don't ever forget that. And Leonard, it's not so much a matter of seeing the fruit, but knowing there is fruit because of your faithfulness. I really like this hat. I'm not sure how to wear it. I think it's this way. Is this way? See, it's even a little big on me. The number one point is the goodness of God. We've heard that during the week about the goodness of God. Um, if, if, you, if you were here when I was pastoring, do you remember one thing I always used to tell you? No matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's good or bad going on in your life, what are you supposed to do? Praise the Lord. Who said that? Did you say that? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, now I'm disappointed. I thought maybe Becky remembered. I don't know. <laughs> but, but when we praise God, miracles happen. I know it's hard to take me seriously. When we praise God, miracles happen. So, if you're having struggles with your family, bring them before God, and then thank God for them right where they are, because He has been watching over them all the time. He has been watching over this church all the time. He knows what's going on. You know, not everything is perfect. Someone in your family is a little bit off. Someone in the church might be a little bit off, and we need to pray for them, because... Spirits that are not of God will convince people to go the wrong direction, just like in the New Testament. So realize that you need to personally seek God and say, God, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to know? To know that he will lead you and that he will direct you. And so when you're praying for your kids, if God tells you to do something, do that. 
But if he doesn't tell you what to do, just thank God for them right where they are. Jack and his wife, Jeannie, have been married for how many years? 14 years. He said they've never had an argument. They've had discussions. <laughs> Wendy and I have had discussions. But you know what? When we don't agree, I thank God for her. Because many times she's kept me from going the wrong way. If you don't come into agreement with your church board, thank God. Thank God, because maybe there's something you're not seeing. Maybe there's something God is protecting you from. So, anyway. We're done. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, so praise God all the time. Believe in miracles, that's number three. And number four, pass it on to the next generation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for people that make our lives interesting, like Jim Atkinson and Gordon Martin and even Becky. All right, and Tim. Tim introduced me. God, Tim introduced me to uh, Michael W. Smith. What a wonderful musician. I never met him personally. God, thank you for the uniqueness in the body of Christ. Thank you for Pastor Dan and his wonderful wife and how they, they lead this church. Thank you for each member that participates and puts things together. But Lord, we just, we just ask you, first of all, help us to remember the goodness of God and believe in the goodness of God. Secondly, help us to praise you in all things and for all things, knowing that you are working all things together for good. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to believe in miracles. And then finally, help us to pass it on to the next generation. In Jesus' name. God bless you, brother, and thank you so much. Had to get up here quick, I didn't know if you'd start again. Carrie, that was very good, thank you. Uh, Carrie Estes, that uh, would like to share. Um, I just wanted to share that both of these pastors have made such a difference in our life, and often we don't have a chance to thank people for that kind of thing, but uh, we're really thankful, I'm thankful for, um, well, it's kind of, here, I'm going to go right through so that I'm not with my back. So my back. Um, but when you had us go to Joshua and did the Battle of Jericho, Len may remember when uh, we had teen talent back in the day, and I played that song with my trombone. And I got third place in the state, and there were only three people. So. <laughs> but um, both of these pastors have made such a difference in my life. Um, I mentioned the orchestra, and that, how many of you played in the orchestra? Yeah, that was awesome. That was a good connection, connecting for us. And um, with Pastor Vensky, he didn't do a very good job about bragging about his kids, but I'll do it for you. Um, I'm thankful for Sarah because she was our flower girl. And um, I, I heard later that they bribed her with a doll to be my flower girl. And I thought, you know, they probably didn't have a lot of money. And they went and paid for that doll. And that was so nice of them. And then Amy, she is actually the elementary principal at Rosal. Did you guys know that? Isn't that awesome? And um, Katie has been a missionary. Katie, is that right? Well, isn't that great fruit from this church? That is awesome. Um, and then Gary and I are in a really interesting position because we've pastored with these people in the section. So it, we've been like um, mentored by Pastor Vensky. Um, when Pastor Len was here, I was from eighth grade to twelfth grade. And when Pastor Vensky was here, we were in college. And it's really nice to come home from college and know that you have someone cheering you on to go in ministry. So we really appreciate that, and thank you for asking Gary to speak at the <laughs> men's breakfast. Um, and also, Pastor Dan has been such a blessing to us. Yes, and he's actually the presbyter. Um, did you guys know he's the presbyter of our section? Yeah. And uh, Gary's the assistant presbyter, and that looks really good because Gary does not want to be the 
presbyter at all, but he'll give devotions now and then at the meeting. So we appreciate Pastor Dan for doing that. Um, now, and we really do thank the Vetskis for being there beside us, not just growing up, but as pastors in the section, other pastors we could look for to. I remember going to the Pillager Fellowship meetings, and it wasn't too long before uh, Matthew was coming along. I know he's such a joy in their lives and all of our lives as we follow him. If they're not friends on Facebook, you better be, because he, he's the most fun guy around. But um, Lynn, I wanted to share, and I told him this before, how many of you do remember one sermon that has changed your life? They say, like, you may remember five sermons, or, but how many of you remember five people that changed your life? Like how many of you do remember five people that changed your life? Well, I remember a sermon that changed my life, and it was Len's sermon. And so I think Bruce might remember this sermon. But he had talked about reading the Bible. And if you read the Bible so many days, so many um, so many chapters a day or so many hours a day, then you would get through it in a year. So that was the end of January. So February 1st, when I was 14, I started reading the Bible. And I read it every day all through high school until someone said, you can't read the Bible at night. You have to read the Bible in the morning. Well, that didn't work for me. But I have read the Bible since. But um, that helped me because through high school, I really didn't feel like I had a lot of the temptations. And I know it's because he put us on the road of reading the Bible. Do you remember that sermon? A little bit, yeah. So we really appreciate that. But also during the pandemic, we have a very rare situation that we were kind of like their pastors because they came to our church online during the pandemic. And he even came and visited us and played his accordion. So I'm sorry you didn't get to see his accordion tonight, but he's pretty good at that. Um, but I have a really unusual call in my life. It's to be beside Gary in ministry. But my real call has to do with going back to religious release, release time. How many of you went to release time in Pillager or taught or any time and taught it? Um, when I was young, I went to release time. That meant a lot to me. And then when we went to Palisade, um, they needed someone to teach release time. So we did that. But I appreciate what you said about a death of a young person. I had a young lady at release time, and she didn't go to church that I know of, but she came and rode her bike into our yard. And she said, I'm so glad that I'm a Christian. I taught her in bed. Because I know that if I went to die, I would go to heaven. And it was through release time. And unfortunately that summer she did pass away in, a, in an accident. I spoke at the, the funeral, and I knew it made a difference. But now I have a really unusual ministry, and it's an undercover youth pastor at Pequot. So I lead uh, the release time for the high school and the baccalaureate. And the release time, when we moved there, they said, we're going to quit having release time. We don't have any to lead. So, you know, I love release time, right? So we did that. And I'm really thankful for the people that went before us and taught us things like that, so we could do that. And one of the things that was really huge, that when you ended tonight, you talked about praise. And the joy, obviously, in Melissa. Um, but we all remember Virgil. And one time, after Sunday school, I asked Virgil, um, what is the secret of your, of your joy? Because he just shined, right? Virgil shined. And Virgil said praise, and so praising. So I guess the thought that I just really have is what makes a difference? Virgil saying that, you know, made a difference. The ministry of these pastors made a difference. And Bruce, all that you've done here, I think has made a difference for us too. So I just wanted to thank you guys specifically for the ministry because it goes on with us now. So with that, we're going to close down for the evening. I believe there's um, grub, food, something up there, up the ramp. Uh, just follow your nose once you get out the door. Okay. Uh, but again, thanks for coming out. And if you're able to come uh, tomorrow morning, 9.30 is the sharing time for Sunday school. 10.30 is the regular service. John, um, just making sure you know.
Um, uh, if you're able to uh, be there with us tomorrow morning, it would be great. Uh, if not, as you leave uh, this evening, God's blessing be upon you and your travels. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you again and again for the testimonies, for your word uh, being preached, being, being brought forward. Uh, Lord, and, and the, the, the testimonies and the history of what has taken place here, Lord, as we look to the future, that we bear it very well for your glory and honor, uh, Lord, that the things that have been done in the past weren't in vain, but we carry it uh, faithfully, loyally, for your glory. We thank you for entrusting to us to be steward of your word, of the ministry and influence in this area. To you be the glory.